You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Greetings. Hello, Ryan. Howdy, Michael. Hey, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for uh, giving the podcast support. I really appreciate it. If you're here for the first time, listen to some other episodes. Write a review. Tell us what you think. You can follow us on the podcast and uh, keep up to date with what we're doing at Inside You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, at Inside You Pod on Twitter. I really appreciate you choosing this podcast. There's so many other podcasts around, but you know I get deep. You know I get real. I keep it real, Ryan. We get deep. We get deep. And we got a great podcast today in just a second, but I just want to share a few things with you. Uh Uh-huh. I am going to be in St. Louis this coming weekend to sign autographs. Tom Welling and I are doing a Smallville Nights. Then I'll be in Liverpool the weekend of the 21st. Uh, I will be in June 10th that weekend. I'll be in Illinois, Metropolis, Illinois, Metropolis, Illinois, signing mm-hmm. autographs, doing the small little nights. And then I'll be going to Australia June 17th through the 27th. Perth and Sydney, get your tickets. Um, a lot of fun to be had. Um, also, uh, want to thank my patrons, lovable patrons. I always give them a shout out at the end, all their names, the top tier patrons. If you want to support the podcast, it means a lot. It helps the podcast substantially. Go to patreon.com slash inside of you. Also, a big stage at 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. Um, May 28th, 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. Get your tickets. Go to stageit.com or you can go to sunspin.com. We also have Zooms if you want to get a Zoom. And I'm on the Cameo. That's about all I'll say about that. Uh, Patreon, you can join Patreon by going to patreon.com slash inside of you and support the podcast. Uh, Judd Apatow. Yep. This is one that Ryan was starstruck. It's not often you meet somebody who sort of shaped your comedy brain. <laughs> That's sort of true. I mean, yeah. he, he shaped everyone's brain. Yeah. Comedy brain. He's, uh, what I love about him is he's the kind of guy that you can direct message into Instagram and, he'll, mm-hmm. and say, Hey, I'd love you to do my podcast. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, I get people that are half the stars he is, one fourth the stars that don't even respond. He responded and he came on the podcast and he was so open and funny and giving. He sent me a whole bunch of cool stuff to watch, to prepare for the interview, like the George Carlin special that's coming out, yeah. uh, Bubble. Uh, yeah, the Bubble. I mean, t- he's just, uh, he's extraordinary. His books, uh, he, you're going to hear about it all. Uh, without further ado, we should just get into it because it's a wonderful, wonderful time I had with Judd Apatow. Let's get inside of Judd Apatow. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. Yeah. I mean, the first thing you said is like, oh, you collect shit. I collect shit. Uh, And that made me feel good because I've had many people like Bob Odenkirk, Dak Shepard, guys have come in here as I name drop and they just uh, sort of say, what's wrong with you? Why do you get autographs? Why do you collect things? What's what's going on? So wrong. That's so Bob. (laughs) It's so so Dax (laughs) to like shit on our joy and our memorabilia. (laughs) Bob in his house without one breaking bad, like <laughs> fake drug packet. Yeah. That's what we would have done. We would have took the blue meth right. from the set, from yes. the prop people, and framed it. Framed it. That's you where it should be. It. I have breaking bad memorabilia in there, and I wasn't even in, on the show. Come on. Dax could have had a without a paddle, paddle <laughs> up on the wall. I'm all for that stuff. I remember Jim Carrey framed some of his outfits from the movies so in his house. He had a movie theater. I still he still does, and and so he would have you know the the Ace Ventura outfit and the Cable Guy outfit, and I thought that's the coolest thing ever. I loved it. I'm all for the worship of all of that stuff. I, when I was a kid, obsessed with autographs. Yeah. So I'm like a kid on Long Island. I just so want to touch showbiz. I don't know how to do it. And as a little kid, the only thing I could think of was writing letters, and there would be these little books you could get. Homes of the Stars, and they'd show like Lucy's house and Jimmy Stewart's house, and in the back it would have the address of NBC and ABC. And I would just sit there all day long writing letters to James Garner and Hal Linden. Come on, you, and, you did that? You you wrote letters to hundreds of, of hundreds of, and I got tons of weird autographs. I have Gilda Radner's autograph from back then, Jackie Gleason. They're probably all written by secretaries. I figured out later. <laughs> 
And that breaks my heart. I doubt it. Come on, you really think so? Who knows? Gilda seems real. <laughs> and and I love that collection. And I was laughing uh, because there was a, like a fire scare in our neighborhood a few years ago. And like that was one of the first things I grabbed to put in the car when we were evacuating was my autograph collection from sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with that. No, it's what, the best. What do you have? First of all, your wife, Leslie Mann, who I think is fucking hilarious and hot. Can I say that? I agree. Yeah. But how do you, I mean, does she say, no, Judd, we're not putting that in the house. Oh, that, oh does she, she turn knows, things down? Oh, she knows that, uh, that I'm weird about that stuff. And the funny thing is I know the second I die, it goes in a dumpster. <laughs> There's no one who will go like, let's go through dad's stuff and I'll hang some of it in my house to remember dad. It's straight in the burner. <laughs> There's no one who cares about it. I can't even get my kids to sit with me once to go, do you want to look, look at it? Zero. But I have my office and- What do you have in there? What are your like most, like the, the things that you love the most? That they're on the wall that your prized possessions. What are those? Well, I just switched offices. My old office had what you would expect. The posters from the movies signed and, and photos of everyone we've worked with, things like that. Then I just moved to new offices. All the walls have nothing on them because I'm like, I guess it's like a new era oh. and I should let the present moment determine it. I shouldn't just- hang all the freaks and geeks posters like I normally would do. But that's you. But the one thing I did do, because I, I don't know what to hang. I was on eBay and somehow I saw that some guy in Canada spent his whole life taking Polaroids with celebrities and having them sign the Polaroid. And in the pictures, it looks like a guy in his early 60s. And there were 140 of them. It's literally like him with the Smothers Brothers, and then the next one is Rudy Giuliani, and the next one is some Canadian star and Sean Cassidy. And I bought them, and I'm doing this six foot by six foot frame of this man who I don't know, and all of his all photos of his Polaroids. with celebrities. That's just a conversation piece. So maybe that's the way. But that's I'll cool. Do it. Yes. Oh, I, I I think it's the coolest thing ever. But when I tell my family that. They give me a look, which shows they don't think that's cool. Really? So Maude and Iris and, and Leslie, they don't get autographs. They don't care about that stuff. When you go on to a set, by the way, do you, when you work with somebody that you were enamored by or someone you really loved, and I don't know if you feel that way now. I don't know if you get enamored because you've worked with a lot of great people, but do you get, you still get a little starstruck? Do you still like, I got to get this signed eventually? Or I, or you don't think like that? I certainly do. I guess it's less people because I feel like as I get older, I feel like we're all trying to do the same thing. So the person yeah. that you might have been in awe of when you were young, when you get older like me, you know he's in the same hell as me trying to write the new album or right. not screw up the new movie. Right. And you don't <laughs> feel like they're in another place. You feel like, oh, that's a an artistic person trying not to make shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. And so whatever, whoever it is, it's Mick Jagger. He's like, how do I make another record people will pay attention to? Right. But every once in a while, there'll be someone that really gets you. Like I was just talking to somebody about Eminem, who was in This Is 40. Oh. And that's the kind of person that I get scared around. Really? One, because I'm just so in awe of what he's done. And I'm not in that world. You so have I'm nothing not, in common, you feel. I, I mean, I probably do have things in common, but just on the surface, my like childlike anxiety, I feel uh, intimidated. And, and also just whatever, the attitude of, of rap. And, you know, there's a, it's so different than comedy because it's built on bravado and we're right. built on like being proud to be terrified. Yes. Like our insecurities. Fuck. So it's just a different stance. Yeah. But then he was riotously funny and improvising really? and and was a, a huge fan of Superbad. Said he watched it a zillion times. It could literally recite the movie beginning to end. Does that just make you feel awesome when oh, you hear yeah. that from these guys? Oh, yeah. Just the idea of him sitting in his house watching Superbad 30, 40 times <laughs> laughing. You know, you, you also yeah. think, how happy is that guy made me? The fact that at some point he's in his house cracking up at Seth and and Jonah and Bill Hader and Emma and everybody and Martha in super bad. Right. You know, that's the greatest feeling ever. 
Yeah. Do, yeah. I can't like I, the first thing I thought of when I was going to talk to you was like, and we met doing stand up. I know mm-hmm. you do stand up a lot. You've been yeah. stand up your whole life, which we can get into. But you're the first person that's given me a homework for the interview. You gave me a lot of stuff, which was now listen, this was a lot, but it was great. Like I, I had the time. And no one <laughs> has seen any of this, which is the the funny part, because I realized that I was very productive during the pandemic, and I didn't know what that said about me. That during this crisis, I just went straight to work. So I finished my book, "Sicker in the Head," which is another book of interviews with comedy people, right? And some, you know, Jeff Tweedy's in it too, and Gail King, but it's mainly like Sasha Baron Cohen and Nathan Fielder and Will Hannah Farrell. Gatsby and. And everybody, yeah. And so I, I was like, everyone's home. They have <laughs> to say yes. Timing. They can't say no. I know they're home, <laughs> so they and I know they're going on. <laughs> yeah, and they're all vulnerable and in right. a place where they're thinking about things. I'm sure you found that during uh, your podcast that people are just oh, much yeah. more reflective than they were. Sure. And then I had been working on this George Carlin documentary. I started it right before the pandemic. Awesome. I let me tell you, I I didn't really. I hate, I'm embarrassed to say, but I really. It's not that I wasn't a big George Carlin fan. I just wasn't educated on him. And this boy is this an education of George Carlin, the influence he had, who he was, the hardships he went through when he hit rock bottom, and like other comedians were sort of making fun of him at a certain time. You know, when he was doing blow, and his wife was an alcoholic, and his daughter stuck in the middle of all of this shit. I was like, this is intense as hell, and I really learned a lot. I love this documentary. When does when does it come out? Uh, it's going to come out mid to late May, and I'm really proud of it. In the beginning, I thought, I don't know how we could do something as good as the Gary Shandling documentary, because Gary was so open about his feelings. He really expressed himself right. in every situation. He just he was just cutting a vein everywhere. That's what he was looking for. He was looking for the answers, right? Yeah, and he wanted to tell you what he was feeling, and he wanted to go deep, and he wanted to talk about going deep. So when you would look up interviews that he did with people like Kevin Smith or Mark Maron. It was all there. I mean, there was a great line Gary had in one of the interviews. I think it was with Mark Maron. It might've been Kevin Smith. He said, life is short, but not short enough. (laughs) And so there was all this stuff. And I thought, well, George Carlin never told us anything about himself. Was it just the period? Was it the sense of like just the, the time period that he sort of grew up in? And- Probably. I mean, it was an era where we didn't know that much about Alan King's life right. and people from that era. Yeah. And his act, none of it was personal. Zero. He didn't tell you about his wife and his daughter. And he he it was all in his mind and his observations of people and life. But it wasn't an observation of his behavior. Right. And then when he did interviews, he... He rarely went deep about any of it. But then we found that he was working on his autobiography uh, with Tony Hendra, uh, who played the manager in Spinal Tap, who was a <laughs> writer, and he passed away, I believe, this year. And he talked to Tony for this book for 23 hours, and we found these tapes. And you listen to when you make a documentary, how much harder is it to make a documentary than actually making a film? Because you have a script, you follow the script, you, you know, but with a documentary, it's sort of like the research that goes into it to find all these things and then piece them together and make it somewhat linear. Mm-hmm. How long do you have a team of people helping you out with this? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot of work to to just listen to his 14 HBO specials. You listen to every special. I mean... I can't say I listen to every second of every special. I, I usually use my team to go, let's prioritize. There's a lot of stuff that isn't as good as the best stuff. Right. And so we don't have to, you know, get super deep on the things that weren't working, but it becomes clear that if there's 14 hours of stuff, maybe there's four incredible hours that we have to really pay attention to. Right. And our editor, Joe Beshenkovsky, who did the Shanling doc and the Kurt Cobain doc, and he did, Belushi, he's incredible. He remembers everything. He literally remembers everything. If he watches a special, it just seems to be all in his mind. And he's a real artist and a big part of our process. And my partner, Michael Bonfiglio, who uh, who I also did a 30 for 30 about Dwight Gooden and Daryl Strawberry. Dude, I got to get into that. I mean, that's, yeah. that was fucking phenomenal. And I know you're a big Met fan. Yes. You're from Flushing. 
I've, well, I was born in Flushing. Flushing. That's true. I, I was born in Long Island, mm -hmm. and you know, I know what it's like to feel like a loser because I'm a, a Rangers <laughs> fan, I'm a Mets fan, I'm a Knicks fan, I'm a Giants fan. Giants have had some success. Give me the lineup, '86 lineup in the World Series for the Mets. Can you do it? It's so funny because I just watched <laughs> that uh, the documentary about the Mets. Uh, that awesome was, six parter or some shit. Yeah, it was yeah. fantastic. Uh, so let's see. I'll, let's see who I can remember. All right, who was the Wally leader? Backman, Lenny Dykstra. Dykstra these are right. Dykstra let yeah. it off. Then Backman. I, I mean, I, I don't know if I could say it all in order. Kevin Mitchell. Oh yes. Uh, uh, Keith Hernandez. Nice. Let's see how 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 deep I can go. I have a terrible memory. That's the other thing. really the other thing. I have a pretty bad memory. Like I just thought, oh my god, you're gonna you're gonna forget. Ron Darling. Oh yes. Jesse Orozco. Yes. Uh, you know what I did? I was I was watching that documentary, and I went online, and I don't know if it was connected to the documentary as like like an extra on ESPN. It might have been that they had one of the games from the World Series, and I watched a bunch of the game, and it was Bob Costas doing the game, and it was interesting how slow it was, and how baseball and television. They, they hadn't decided to try to find ways to amp it up. And there's a commercial on the screen during the game and music and energy. And it was really fun and relaxing to just so relaxing. listen to the, the commentators. And it was a completely different vibe. I just remember Joe Garagiola yeah. and Vince Scully and they're announcing a game and just like, it's so chill. And it's like, you know, and the big question will be, whatever happened to oil can Boyd? High drive in a right field. <laughs> yeah. Henderson goes back, and it's gone. And if you're a young Daryl Strawberry, I mean, I just remember these moments like that. Sure. I mean, so you're a Mets fan. I love yeah. that. I love Doc and Daryl. That was fantastic. Did you get to hang out with them a lot? Mike, uh, my partner, you know, did all the interviews. My, you know, my role, I feel, in a lot of these documentaries is to really locate the heart of it uh, you know i i look at it as a storyteller for instance in that documentary we we slowly realized that doc was still struggling mm -hmm. and it was very difficult to figure out the edit because we thought we were making a documentary about two people who had triumphed over their addictions and he was still dealing with the addiction slowly we were like i think that's not what this is and then i wasn't sure what the ethics were of discussing that in any way. And I didn't want to make a documentary outing someone that was trying to be secret about the fact that they still Especially had an when addiction. they think your motive is to be talking about how they overcame yes. right this shit and now it's like yeah you, that that's very that's a tough thing yeah, to do. Yeah, I'm not trying to make them look bad. Right. But at the same time as soon as we start it we have to be honest about what we're seeing. And I think we made some artful choices to indicate what was happening. Right. Let so, the audience kind of see what's going on as opposed to stuffing it down their yeah. throat. And just be careful about what we were saying when, so you could do the math to see that this is a, a struggle that lasts your entire life. And, and you know, maybe Daryl hasn't fallen off the wagon, but he owns rehabs. So in order to stay sober, he has to literally own rehabs. So that's how often he has to, reinforce these messages and and doc obviously he's fallen on and off the wagon he got arrested after the movie was made yeah. and struggles and you know i certainly pray that he can overcome all of that yeah uh, but it was it was interesting to try to look at these two men who had a similar experience they they were very very young and the city looked to them to change everything yeah and then they did but they were too young to handle New York City and cocaine and partying in the 80s, which was the 80s at its worst. And it ate them up. And they were, I think they were very brave to, you know, to talk about it. And there's some interesting material in the 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 new Mets documentary, which everyone should see. I wish you would make a movie about the 86 Mets. About those plane, those flights, those. Yes. There's whole books about those. I mean, flights. I know, but wouldn't that be a fascinating movie? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's all even darker than we think. It, it got. It's uh, almost I, like unacceptable right now to even bring some of the shit that they were I, doing I think out. so. I, th I think. Yeah. And like a lot of businesses, there are things happening that are even beyond. 
Right. That when you dig deeper, uh, there's there's behavior, you know, that is, uh, you know, well. I I, I I don't want to use the word criminal, but, but you know, well, there's a I lot mean, of bad things happening. <laughs> yes. You know, that it's not even about today. You know, it's just how people treated each other, how they treated women. Right. And different time period, not to say it was right and it wasn't, but it was a different. Well, a different time period in the sense that I don't think society had said no fucking way. We're not doing any of this. Right. And so something about the culture was a party, Studio 54. Society hadn't put their foot down. No, and I think all. that, you know, certainly the world of athletes uh, is not a world that is about respecting women and their boundaries and understanding consent and things like that. Right. It is a world of people partying hard, getting each other wasted, and everything that flows from that. Right. You know, which is generally not good. Inside of You is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Don't go anywhere, because if you haven't had Magic Spoon, you're truly missing out. I love this cereal. When I was a kid, I loved cereal, but then I got older, and it was all these sugars and all these horrible things that they put in these cereals, and then Magic Spoon happened, Ryan. We've we've had some Ryan Spoon here on the show. Some Ryan Spoon? Ryan Spoon. We've had some Magic Spoon, <laughs> Ryan. Some both, yeah. Uh -huh. We've had both. And uh, we do love it. And uh, since I started incorporating Magic Spoon in my daily morning routine, um, I've noticed fewer cravings oh. throughout the day because that's my fix, man. <laughs> Cereal is my fix. And uh, look, let me tell you about Magic Spoon. Not only is it delicious and comes in different flavors, zero grams of sugar, 13 to 4 grams, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Only 140 calories a serving. Keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. What else you got, Ryan? And you can build your own box. Available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, Ooh. fruity, mm. frosted, peanut butter, cookies and cream, maple waffle, blueberry, cinnamon, plus the newly reformulated honey nut flavor that will now be added to Magic Spoon's permanent collection they just keep getting new flavors for this magic spoon i've had friends by the way call me and email like, dude seriously man between us is magic spoon good yeah and i'm like yeah i don't know what else to tell you it's delicious and then they text me back and they go yeah it's really good thanks for thanks for that uh i love magic spoon and it's easy to get magic spoon you just go to magic spoon.com slash iou to grab a custom bundle of cereal and be sure to use our promo code IOU at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. I don't know how you don't try out Magic Spoon. Try it out for me. Uh, if you like the podcast, you believe what I'm saying, I think you're going to really dig it. Try Magic Spoon. And remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash IOU and use the code IOU to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode of Inside of You. Inside of You is brought to you by Faraday. Uh, this is another product that, if you look in my closet, we can go up there after so you show, so you see, Ryan, that I am not lying. I oh. have at least six shirts. And a few skeletons. And a few skeletons in the closet. Yep. But the Faraday shirts are so... You, you can't believe how comfortable they are. They almost feel like stretchy. They're so soft. They're light. You could wear them anywhere. And I know that, you know... The, the, the summer's coming and people are like, you know, uh, what do I wear? Faraday is something that you could wear to to look good, just to look good at any time. It's not too fancy, but it could look nice enough to be fancy. It looks laid back at the same time. It's just a cool, cool product. Faraday is a family-run brand making high-quality, timeless clothing with modern design and functionality. It's that kind of effortless style you want every time you go digging into your closet. That set, that shirt, that dress. That feels like you've had them for years. Maybe it's in a gorgeous print and it looks like it might be vintage, but it fits so well that it feels like it was just made yesterday just for you. Well, that's Faraday. Yeah. And people, it's funny because I always say, hey, feel this shirt, man. No, no, I don't want to feel your shirt. I go, no, 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 no. Feel my shirt. And then they feel it. My friend Denise felt my shirt. She's <laughs> like, wow. I'm like, yeah, Faraday. Faraday's pretty incredible. Faraday's so confident in the quality of their stuff, they have a lifetime guarantee of quality. They'll replace or fix your clothes forever. Who does that? No matter what, they will replace your clothes 
forever. They will fix or replace your clothes forever. Talk about making it easier to get dressed. And right now, Faraday is giving all my listeners, inside of you listeners, 20% off. That's 20% off. Head to FaradayBrand.com and use code inside of you at checkout to snag 20% off all your new spring staples. That's code inside of you at Faraday, F-A-H-E-R-T-Y, brand.com for 20% off. FaradayBrand.com for 20% off. How do you how do you do it? I mean, you, you you don't stop working. It's like when I was getting all this stuff, I was like, how does he have the, he's got two kids, he's married, he's got this movie, The Bubble, coming out, he's got a documentary come out, he wrote a new book, he's got all this shit. I'm like, you're like what do you how do you do it? How do you balance this without getting divorced? And how do you, are you a workaholic? Would you honestly say you have to constantly be working or you'll be miserable? It's hard to know because I just went away uh, with Leslie for nine days to Hawaii and I always felt pretty good in the shutdown. You didn't work? Not much. I mean, I had to make some <laughs> calls, but I wasn't, you know, pounding it there. I I, I shut it down. And, and sometimes there's, you know, a summer where we're mainly in shutdown and I certainly can handle it. But I think that's the thing I'm always trying to decide, you know, Am I working for a healthy reason? Am I just trying to keep myself busy and distracted? Am I passionate about what I'm doing? You know, what what is the actual motivation for work? Right. You know, I, you know, I've done a bunch of things. Do I need to do another one here like this? Right. Or am I just kind of on a treadmill where things come up and you're busy and you haven't really thought through if you want to give your time to it? Does Leslie make you aware sometimes of it? Like, hum, hello. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I think that, you know, the rhythm of her career is also different than the rhythm of a producer's career and a writer's career. So actors have to be ready when called into action. Right, right. And so, and, and there's periods between it, which, which can be long. <clears throat> and then you go and you're 100% committed to making that movie and creating that character. And then you go home and you you rest and you wait and you can you know, take a hunk of time to recharge where for me, everything is, you know, a long multi-year process. So we're working on Billy Eichner's movie, which comes out in the fall. You know, we've been working on that movie for five years. When you say working on for five years, is it sort of intermittent? Like, you know, notes every, like every couple months, you're like, Oh, we got to go back to that because I know that you probably have a lot of plates spinning. So is yeah. it one of these things that every couple of months you have to kind of answer these? It's like, when is it? How long before it comes into fruition? Well, you know, it's meetings and discussions of the outline for a long time. And then suddenly Billy and Nick Stoller, who wrote it with him and directed, you know, do a pass. So you're waiting. Like for me, it's different than them. They're working a lot of that time. And I'm waiting to be fresh eyes and give a good read and have discussions about what's working. And then it becomes, all right, well, how are we going to? make this how much money do we need to make this how long would it take who should be in it how would you market it yeah and then that's years of that those conversation and that's true you might have eight of these going at the same time right and you don't know if they're going to go and sometimes you work on it for half a decade and then suddenly everyone says we don't want to make it and you, you how <laughs> often does that happen more than you think i mean it happens you know for sure and how personal do you take that depends on the project sometimes you know, it's very personal because you're really ready to go and maybe the last second the whole thing crumbles. And it's like a runner stumbling. And what causes that usually for something Sometimes just last minute to casting do? Casting dro drops out and then you can't crack the perfect chemistry casting again. Because I'm all about that. If, I, if, if that doesn't <clears throat> feel right, I always think there's no reason to go. I'll never push something forward if I don't think all that is a home run. Right. And sometimes people just say, oh, people don't want a movie like that anymore. Oh, that movie's too weird. Yeah, we just put out a weird movie, and uh, we don't think people like weird movies. And suddenly you're like, wait, I got four of these. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> that are kind of eccentric, and they're right. not, you know, a generic type of movie. Right. But it it definitely does happen. And you have to spin the plates, because I remember early in my career, I spent like three or four years on one script, because I thought that's what you do. What script was that? I wrote a script with Owen Wilson, and it was right after Bottle Rocket. Which I love. And a uh, cable guy. Lo yeah. I love Bottle, Bottle Rocket. Rocket. Just genius. And we, we wrote this script uh, about 
a man who got in a drunk driving accident, but wasn't an alcoholic. And his sponsor at AA, where he was forced to go by the courts, was Rip Torn. And it was Rip Torn convincing him that he was an alcoholic, even though he wasn't. And this strange friendship between them. And I worked on it for years. And and just right when I was ready to go, it was, nope, we don't want to do it. And it never happened. And it never happened. How often do they never come back? Or how often do they come back? Like projects that you are, they say, no, we're not doing this. How often? Because you hear these things like kickball, dodgeball, Mm -hmm. dodgeball. And it, it took 12 years. And the studio didn't want to do it. And they didn't want to do it. And finally, after 12 years... That seems like it rarely, rarely happens where when something's turned down, it hangs in there and comes back. I mean, we've had that a fair amount of time. Superbad took forever. I mean, Superbad was floating around when we were doing Freaks and Geeks. Wow. And we made it in 2006 or around six or seven. Uh, and they had been working on it since they were like 13 years old. I Jesus. mean, this was the, their Seth and Evans dream was, was this movie and everyone said no forever. And then other movies started succeeding like Talladega nights and things that I was working on. And then people said, what, what else do you have? And so we had a trunk of rejected projects. The other one was pineapple express, which, was only written because we couldn't believe anyone. There was no one to make super bad. And so we were like, what's more commercial than super bad? Oh, we could do like a stoner action movie. Like what if Jerry Bruckheimer made a stoner movie Perfect. a stoner action movie. And then we sent that around and everyone was like, no, we don't like that either. <laughs> and then Jesus. when super bad did well, they were like, okay, we'll do pineapple after that so So once you've proven yourself or once you see that there's success in this they go oh we believe in this filmmaker we believe in this team we'll give them this other one yeah we get seth and evan's sense of humor and their style and we see what what seth is doing on screen and suddenly it gets a little bit easier Uh, and but we've had things get delayed like you don't mess with the zohan so Adam says to me, Adam Sandler, do you want to write this movie with Robert Smigel about a hairdresser, who, you know, Mossad, a Mossad agent in Israel who wants to move to America and retire and be a hairdresser. <laughs> and so I worked on that with Robert Smigel, who's the best comedy writer in the world. So we, we had a script we really liked in like 2000, around that time. And then 9-11 happens. And we were like, oh, I guess you can't do that now. Like everything about what we're satirizing is much more heated. Right. I think we we put it in a trunk before 9-11 when there was the Intifada a year or two before that. And then every once in a while, we would take a run at, could you rewrite it? I thought after 9-11, there was a way to do the movie about a cell, a terrorist cell. And I, I, I was saying, you know, can't we do it about, like Rob Schneider is in a terrorist cell and he slowly falls in love with America. And then in the end, he doesn't want to do it. And then he teams up with Adam. And then that didn't happen. Right. And, and probably shouldn't have. Uh, <laughs> and then one day Sandler just called me and just said, we're going to do, you don't mess with the Zohan. And that was 10 years later, 10 years yeah. later. And Smigel rewrote it and got it ready to go. And it was a big hit and hit a window where people were willing to laugh about conflict. And, Cause it really was a satire of, the ridiculousness of people fighting and not understanding each other, not caring about each other. I mean, it's a very silly right. movie, but that was the idea that you could do a really goofy movie that at its heart was about that it's ridiculous, that this that it's just an endless cycle of, of violence. We, obviously, we weren't getting into any real issues right. of, of the Middle East, but somehow it happened at a time when it had quieted down enough where people really enjoyed the movie. Yeah. Do you miss any project from yesteryear? 
like over the years, all these projects you have, is there one that you're just like, got to make that someday, got to make that someday. And, and also are there most of those projects that you're like, eh, I can see why I think it made, I don't, I'm never going back there. I'm trying to think what sit, you know, sitting around, there's not too many sitting around. I wrote a movie for Will Ferrell and Jack Black like 20 years ago that was called Demon Streets. And it was about two <laughs> motorcycle cops. Awesome. And it was all based on the the like the Tupac and Biggie murders. Uh, like them caught up in the middle of a similar situation. Right. And that didn't go. And that's that's one that I think, oh, if I had the energy you still to sit want down. To kind of like, yeah. I, I want to see Will and Jack on motorcycles. <laughs> Yeah, who doesn't? <laughs> that would be fantastic. Um, what were you like growing up? Were you, I know that you know you were twelve years old when your parents split, right? Uh, yeah, but like fourteen. Fourteen like that. was that difficult for you? I, it was like the defining, you know, trauma, uh, you know, for me because you know when you're a little kid and and the only thing you have in life. It, is these two people getting along and you listen to them and you're looking for wisdom from them. But when they're at full war with each other and back then parents didn't go, Hey, we're getting div divorced, but let's go to therapy to figure out the best ways to not make it hard <laughs> on the kids. They just, you know, <laughs> fuck off. They just battled yeah. in, in front of you. Like in oh, front of oh, you. Oh yeah. I know. I, mean, I know these things. I mean, this was a time when they didn't even think, let's not do this in front of the kids. I don't think I ever heard the phrase, let's not do this in front of the kids. That's funny because my parents, my dad said, I wanted you guys to get through high school and college before we, I did it for you. I'm like, well, why the fuck did, I wish you wouldn't have. You guys were fucking horrible. Yeah. So you they got divorced I mean? after you left yeah, the house. Yeah, I was 26, 27. And I was like, or around there. And I was like, God, I wish you would have got divorced way earlier than yeah. that. It was terrible. It was, you know, yeah. I think so, someone said once, it's better to uh, to to be f from a broken home than to grow up in a broken home. So, something like that. Does That's that make pretty, sense? It makes absolute sense. But so that that I think mentally was was hard for me because I felt like they're they're making a lot of mistakes, and now I don't know what I should believe of what they tell me to do with my life. Hmm. because I see they're not making good decisions and how they're treating each other. Yeah. And that's the thing that threw me. And also they, they fought for a decade. It, it wasn't a rough three months. It just went fully into my adulthood. It wasn't a wound that resolved itself. Right. And so it just kept going and going and through college and going and going. And, that certainly motivated me to want to get my shit together and know how to make a living and know how to take care of myself yeah. because I felt like, oh, I need to be on my shit. Did it also help you focus on, God, I have to go out with healthy women. <laughs> I have to, I want to be in something healthy. Or did it sort of deter you away from dating for a while or just hooking up with girls maybe at a certain age and just enjoying yourself and going, I'm not getting married after what I've seen. I didn't really think about it in those terms. I just thought there's a better way to do it than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I understand more about it now, you know, when I got older and I could talk to my parents about it and I talked to my mom a little bit about it before she passed and it was easier for me to understand them. And now that I'm older than they were when that was happening, I have more of a sense of what went wrong and also what went wrong and how they were taught to relate to, to their spouses in the marriage and that they didn't learn from their parents how to communicate and how to it was do a domino that right. effect. Yeah. I mean, you know, people who were just a generation fresh to the United States, they, they didn't know the psychology of communication and how to talk to each other and how to, how to address difficult things with each other. So it would just erupt because there's no language for how to listen. I, I, I mean, it's like, we know what deep listening is and, and you know, we, I, my whole world is self-help books, but 
They did Really, you read a that. lot of self-help books. Oh, constantly. But when I was a kid, I remember my dad got this book called Your Erogenous Zones by, was it by like Wayne Dyer. And it was the first self-help book ever in the house. And then they got divorced. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I remember my dad said to me once that he went to therapy with my mom. And the therapist was just hard on my mom. Just whatever. You went to a therapist. And in that session, the one time they went, he was hard on my mom. And my mom was like, we're not doing that again. And sometimes it's as simple as that, right? You get the shitty therapist oh, yeah. who doesn't know how to manage the, the moment. And it shuts off the idea of self-exploration. And later in life, I pushed my mom to go to a therapist. She was being you know, really you know, manic and neurotic and hard to deal with. And I finally got her to go. Then she came back and I said, how was it? And she said, he told me I was right about everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted. The best therapist ever. Exactly. He just, he, yeah. Uh, you, you, your mom's working in a, in a comedy store and you started doing yeah. comedy. What is she doing there, first of all? Well, what happened was my mom moved out. And so we were in Sasset and, and she moved to Southampton. And they owned a restaurant together. And one of the bartenders was this guy, Rick Messina. I know Rick Messina. Does he still have the wiffle ball stadium yes. in the back of his house? Yes, and he, he built a wiffle ball stadium <laughs> in his backyard. There. Strawberry Fields. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so he was the bartender at the restaurant they owned. And so when she was divorced, she didn't have any money. So she started waiting tables and selling ads at radio for radio stations. And this was an upper middle class woman who just wanted to play tennis and raise her kids all day. And now she's, you know, blue collar in the workforce. Right. And he would run a comedy club out of this hotel, the Southampton Inn in the summers. And he hired her to be the hostess. And so looking back, and I've said this before, I always thought, what did he pay her? What do you pay someone in 1984, 83 to seat people at a comedy club, not a lot. I mean, minimum wage then was three thirty-five. I remember. So, what, what what could she have made? And then I thought, well, on some level, I would assume she just did it for me, because she would want me to see it. Really? Because I was such a comedy freak, and she never indicated that ever. And I, and on some level, it was a humiliation to her to work for her bartender. You know, she was like someone that her, her grand, her father was a big record producer, who produced Janis Joplin, and they, she came from a lot of money. And now she's seating people at a comedy club, all rich people, all the people that she would be embarrassed to have that job in front of, because my mom is very materialistic and very aware of that Mine stuff. Too, yeah. And I love that she had those kind of jobs. I just thought it was cool. Like, oh, my mom's a waitress at this diner. That's amazing. Yeah. But to her, it was terrible. And... I think on some level she must have thought, this or is maybe good for Judd. psychically felt there's a reason to do this because it's where I met all the comedians and how I started interviewing comedians. Rick gave me a job as a dishwasher at Eastside Comedy Club in Huntington, and everything flew uh, came out of my mom taking that job as a hostess at this comedy. If she club. didn't take a job as a hostess in a comedy store, you think your career would have been completely different? A, a thousand percent because I, you know, I started working as a dishwasher, then a busboy, and I would watch the comedians. I used to watch Eddie Murphy and Rosie O'Donnell in like 1983, 84. Wow. And that's how I made some connections that paid off later in life. And it was where I first did stand up in high school was at Eastside Comedy Club. Jackie Martling used to always come into there, and it was like Bob Nelson and Rob Bartlett and all the, the Long Island legends. And that gave me the courage to interview comedians because I had met them. So I thought, oh, I would love to interview them. So I interviewed them for my high school radio station. And that's when I was able to say, how do you do it? How do you get on stage? How do you write jokes? What's this going to take? Because <laughs> really, that's why I interviewed people initially. To figure things out. Just to figure things out and to, to make them real. Because, you know, you see Hal Linden on TV. He's like a magical figure. Yeah. Right? And then... When, when you get in the room with people, you think, oh, this is possible. You're a person. 
Oh, Jerry Seinfeld in 83, 84, he's from Long Island. Oh, you're kind of like me. So it's not crazy that I would dream that I could do this. Do you remember the first time you went on stage, that very first time? Well, my dad was great. He used to drive me to these clubs, Chuckles in Mineola. <laughs> Chuckles. And, and Governors in Levittown, which is a great club, which is still there. Levittown, wow. And he would drive me and drop me off and pick me up a few hours later. And they were both very supportive. My mom and dad, although they had issues with each other, both always said you could do it and believed 100%. And that was the, the main reason why I think I had So they always the believed confidence. in you. They, not for a second, thought it, that there was a chance I would fail. Were they loving? Were they like, I love you? Whatever you do, yeah. I'll be happy. They were like that. Yes, 100%. And so that was never a question. Like, there was no shame of this is a dumb profession. Right. They knew I loved it and they were excited for me to try to jump into it. And so I would go to all those clubs as an open micer in high school. And that that's how I started. And did you doing really it. enjoy it? Did were you enjoying it or were you nervous nervous wreck to begin with? And oh, you started to the diarrhea. The diarrhea. Dude, what is that? I when I started doing <laughs> I just I, I would have diarrhea. I wouldn't understand it. It would be like explosive diarrhea every time I before I would go up. Yeah, I would just fall apart. So Exhausted, scared. feel like shit. You're and I was so terrible at it. Were you? I mean, I was so bad when I started. When I think about things <laughs> I did on stage, I'm like your worst fringe freak at an open mic night <laughs> who's terrible. <laughs> but I just kept doing it. And I, I learned that it would take a while to figure it out. That's what comedians told me, that it takes a while to figure out who you are. So in my head, every time I bombed, I thought, oh, I'm on the path. It's good that I'm bombing because I am learning how to do this by bombing. And I had a pretty healthy patience about just getting through this early So you were comfortable stage. at some point just bombing. You were used to it. I wasn't comfortable, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was willing to do it. Right. And I thought, well, I'm 17 years old. If it takes me eight years to be a worldwide megastar. So be it. I, I, I'm 25. So I had this psychotic feeling like it'll work out like it actually didn't work out but i mean i did get good enough to to start traveling and right being a normal comedian you, you go to usc we're fast forwarding I, this the whole thing is not going to be that linear but mm -hmm. i don't care um but you go to usc you, you you have a you're part of a writing program and you drop out after two years what, what was the reason why you dropped out we didn't have enough money to pay tuition that's what it was, it was the main thing which is no one had the money that's to pay school. for it yeah but it's funny because you look back and you go, it is an expensive school. How much was it? The tuition was six grand a semester in 1985, 86. And it literally was impossible for me to get six grand. There was just no way to get it. And I got exhausted trying to figure that out and push everybody for the money. And everyone was having real serious financial problems at that time. Right. And so I was a little bit half-assed at school because I thought, I'm not going to finish this program. And you liked it. I liked it at the beginning, and then I think I started getting bummed out that it was clear that I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't afford the film and the camera rentals, and it, it, it just wasn't going to work. And right. then I think I lost some interest in it. And I was getting more interested in stand-up. So you know, when I left, my family wasn't like... Oh man, no, let's, we, we got to figure out how to get that money. They were like, great. What are you going to do now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I had been doing some stand up at college and booking shows at USC when I was there, but I did learn how to write. I had a, one class with Sid Field, the guy who wrote, you know, the screenwriting book that everybody reads. And later when I had friends who started getting opportunities, I realized, oh, I think I know how to write screenplays. It's like that scene in Taxi where out of the blue, Reverend Jim starts playing the piano and he plays the most amazing classical piece. And then he stops and he goes, I guess I took lessons. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I felt when like suddenly um. friends needed writers. <laughs> Inside of You is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp Online Therapy. I can't tell you how many emails or texts or messages I get from people telling me that better help is helping them. And I really love that. I love uh, talking about something that works, that helps people. 
that is a sponsor on the podcast where we talk about mental health. It's very important. Ryan's still with BetterHelp. I'm still with BetterHelp and it's still helping. helping. It's it still, is still helping. helping. I like hearing that. You know, people don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, uh, teeth grinding, even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. And let's not forget about doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, under eating, overeating. Stress shows up in all kinds of ways. And in a world that's telling you to do more, sleep less, and grind all the time, here's your reminder to take care of yourself, to do less, and maybe try some therapy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Ryan, you like to see people. I do. I think it helps. I do too. I like to see the person I'm talking to, but that's just me. If you don't feel like seeing a face, you don't have to. You can also text. You can can do whatever you want. It's so much more affordable than in-person therapy. Trust me on that one. Uh, Going to uh, in-person therapy is, is, is so expensive. It's, I'd say some cases it's triple, quadruple the cost of better help hmm. by far. Uh, you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. I believe it really can, truly. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and inside of you listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash inside. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash inside. Give therapy a shot. Better help online therapy inside of you is brought to you by geico geico asks how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance well of course you would after all who doesn't love a great deal right and when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life geico can help like with insurance for your car truck motorcycle boat and rv even help with homeowners condo or renters coverage you could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages plus add the easy to use geico mobile app available 24-hour roadside assistance and more and choosing to switch to geico becomes an easy choice switch today and see all the ways you could save with great rates and discounts it's easy simply go to geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save wow what was it like? I mean, you've, you've said it before, like you were roommates with Sandler, but everybody wants to know at least a story. What was he like living with at that young age? Was he like, John, do the fucking dishes? <laughs> no, was he wasn't, he <laughs> it wasn't like that. Adam, Adam always had a rental car and he never, ever cleaned it. He would just return it when it was filled almost to the roof with fast food like garbage. <laughs> that was like a really weird thing that he did. He just... He wouldn't wash it, and it would, he, it would trash it, return it, get a fresh one. <laughs> For years, he, he did that. I mean, at that time, and I think it's a lot different than now, comedy was much smaller. There was no internet. And you felt like the whole comedy business was about 100 people. And there were certain people you would meet, and you would think, I think that person's going to be a gigantic star. Even when they weren't near it at all, you felt the bubbling up of certain people like Adam. And you felt Jim that with Carrey Adam. living yeah. with him. You were like this. There's something about this guy. Everyone around Adam was like, Adam's Adam's the next Eddie Murphy. You just knew it. Even when he was bombing, it wasn't like he was killing on stage. And you thought that as a result of the success of his performances, right? We found him hilarious. The crowds was hit and miss, but. There was a certain charisma, which is the charisma which led to everything that happened that you felt when he was in his early 20s. If anything, hotter because he had so much energy as a friend to make you laugh because he wasn't making movies. So all that energy that he's put into his career in the early days was just used on you at dinner <laughs> because he was so funny and he didn't have an outlet. What would he say to you? What would he do? He just was a, at that time a very, you know, gregarious, loud, hilarious person. Right. He loved to make everybody in our group laugh. And I think when you become super famous, that quiets down a bit because in a way the world is paying attention to you. Right. But when no one knows who you are, no one's paying attention to you, it's more fun to make a spectacle out of yourself. It's a, there's a freedom too, isn't there? Yeah, and it, and you still have the knucklehead energy that we all had of college, right? And you've just brought it into the into the real world. So he was just making us laugh 
as friends a ton. And then, you know, he would do, you know, phony phone calls all the time because I, I really felt like it was, he didn't know what to do with this energy. And he would just, you know, call Jerry's Deli and complain about a turkey sandwich that made him sick and really put them through it for like 15 minutes of negotiations about can he have a free sandwich and what kind of sandwich can the free one be? Does it have to be the same sandwich as the one that made me sick? I had the turkey, but maybe I'll have roast beef this time. And I was aware that this was something special. I started recording it because as a comedy fan, I'm like, I'm aware that no one's this funny, that I'm not just like with some guy. That this is world class funny. This is the people that I love, like Michael Keaton and Seinfeld. This is another another right. level, and I believe it's going to turn into something. And then it. Then the weird thing is, you know, one day he says, "Hey, I just got Saturday Night Live," and then he's gone. Wow, that's incredible. You know, I look at all this shit. Not shit, sorry, but you produced yeah. all the. I call it shit. You do? Yeah, sure. Good for you. Shit. It's your shit, man. Yeah. You produced Cable Guy, Anchorman, Talladega Nights, Superbad, Pineapple Express, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, Get Him to the Greek Bridesmaids, The Big Sick. And first of all, I think, you know, you're 54 years old. Mm -hmm. You're five years older than me, and I feel like a complete <laughs> fucking failure. I love all the shit you've done. But I look 20 years older than you. No, you don't. If you shaved, you have gray hair. That's it. That's the only <laughs> fucking difference. But one thing, you know, people talk about is freaks and geeks. And just briefly, you know, I've read inter interviews where you talk about, I knew it was going to get canceled. I knew every week. Was that is that true? Did you really feel like from the get go? Oh yeah, this is going to get canceled. And why? What was the studio's complaints? Why did you feel that this wasn't going to make it? Well, we made it at a time when there was no head of NBC, so the head of programming left, and suddenly there was a more business oriented guy who was above him who got to make all the decisions. And because he wasn't some programming guy who felt the need to ruin your process. He just loved the script. And we said, hey, we want these people in it. And he went, great. Usually, as you know, the, the network will screw with your casting choices because it's the only place that they really can mess with your show. So when you go, I'd like this person to be the lead, they're like, bring me four choices. <laughs> yes. Which is the dumbest part of all of television is this moment where you debate the network. So if you create a show, and you say, I want this person as the lead. If you lose that fight, you've already ruined your show. Your show is done. You you might as well not shoot it. It's it's all about that. And so we've had good and bad experiences with that. But in this experience, he just greenlit everything. We shoot the pilot. Uh, Jake Kasdan came in to direct it. We had Bill Pope as the cinematographer who, who did like The Matrix. Yeah. just one of the greats of all time. And Paul Feig was just so tuned into what he wanted to do with that type of show. And then they hired a head of programming. And very quickly, someone just said, he doesn't like it. Just he, didn't get it. He doesn't get it. They said he went to private school. He, he, he's not feeling it. And so Jesus. from the very beginning, we knew we were in trouble. And, you know, you can see it in the time slot and the marketing and the fact that we would be on for a week and off for two weeks and back for two weeks and off for three weeks. So there was no rhythm to create a relationship with the audience. And we felt like our days were numbered. And then he took me out to lunch and he said, can your characters have more victories? Because it was a melancholy <laughs> show about getting your ass kicked and, and the solace you take from your family and your friends when you're really having a hard time. Would and you say no? That's not what this show's about. Uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, and I had to, and I, I was young enough to not know that that it's bad to be honest. <laughs> I didn't really know how to work those That's relationships. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the thing that I did to give him a victory was there was an episode where Bill is in gym class, and there's a high pop that comes up to him, and he catches it, and he goes crazy celebrating. And then he doesn't realize that it's not the final out and everyone is scoring and tagging <laughs> up. You know, that was as close as a victory. Right. Uh, and so it did turbocharge the show because, you know, when you think you might get canceled at any second, you know, you use all your good ideas. Nothing saved for season two and three. Right. And so it became a, a bit compressed. Well, yeah. And you shot the finale. 
We shot the finale like three episodes before <laughs> the end of the season. Which is crazy. We didn't want it to end. Abruptly. On nothing. Unsettled, right. And so I remember Paul and I were in Las Vegas. That's hilarious. I flew to Vegas to see Rodney Dangerfield with Adam. And By the way, that's my favorite comedian of all time. Yeah. He, so he, yeah, he's the one that we... We, you know, we loved. I had seen him as a kid, and and we got to hang out with him. It was a magic night. But I bumped into Feig, who happened to also be in Vegas, and we were just talking about it. And we, uh, I was like, "Man, let's just do the final episode." He hadn't directed. I, I felt, I felt bad, but he was the best writer on the show. It was such a vision for him. I didn't think that he could keep up with the writing if he was directing, and so I, I hadn't let him direct because I just felt that that was so important. Right. And so I said, just write and direct the last episode and then we'll shoot it in the middle of the season. So if we get canceled, we'll have a finale. And in, in our conversations in Vegas, we were like, what would happen to Lindsay? And we thought, I think she'd become a deadhead. Like that seems <laughs> to be the middle between the right. burnouts and the mathletes would be the deadhead. And then Paul wrote and directed the most incredible finale it's it's really remarkable then i felt guilty that he hadn't directed more episodes but i think the reason why the whole show is good is because uh he hadn't do you do you see that not now but retrospectively when you well when you were on set you get canceled did how did you deal with that failure was it did it was it overwhelming because you don't deal it seems like you don't deal with a lot of failure in your life maybe i'm wrong i i didn't handle any of that well because I really had this gut feeling that magic was happening while we were shooting it. It didn't matter if anyone was watching it. I just thought, I think this is great. And the idea that someone would just go, stop doing it. It felt like if you were a guitar player and someone walked up to you and said, I'm taking away your guitar and you're never getting another one for the rest of your life. That's what it felt like. Jesus. And I had the sense this is... This doesn't happen, this combination of writers and actors and directors and crew. This is special. So the idea that someone would end it, you know, led to me just internalizing all this rage and, and you know, I got a herniated disc and I was on Vicodins and Jesus. in the editing room ranting and, and uh, it was just a terrible time. I remember I was like being really not nice to the editor he, everything, but I'm also on Vicodin. Of course. Right? And I've been there. Uh, and I'm not being nice to him because he just keeps, like something very simple, he just keeps doing wrong over and over and over again. Right. And I'm just like, man, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Or just something like that. And he's like, my friend died yesterday. Oh, man. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> That's, but you know. what, seriously though what is wrong with you <laughs> That's what, actually, and so you do kind of lose your mind in grief because as a child of divorce the show was a family and i couldn't really tolerate the randomness of the disillusion of the family and i felt like we hadn't reached our potential creatively that we were just getting going and obviously a lot of the movies was an attempt, were an attempt to try to tap into all that was happening creatively with all of those different people right. on the show. You know, when you're doing, uh, when you're directing, I always w wondered about this. Are you the kind of director that you get it as written, say it as written, and then you kind of let people improvise? Do you shout things out? What's your process on set like that? Yeah, I think that's about it. I try to write it as well as I can or have them write it as well as they can. Kelly Clarkson! <laughs> did you, did you yeah. do that? Like that was Seth and Evan making a list of curses. So <laughs> we know we're going to whack Steve. We have five cameras on it. We know we can do it once. We've explained to Romney and Seth and Paul Rudd the basic vibe of their reactions to it, although they did react differently than we had planned. And the whole thing was like a start and stop uh, improvisation. But one of the key aspects was that Steve would yell at the waxer. When I was a kid, I went to Action Park 
I and remember New York. Did you see the documentary? Yeah, incredible. And so those cars that would like ride these Alpine slide cars, everyone would always wipe out. They would skin. They would skin their elbows like all the you know they would like fall out of the cart Terrible. and be on this like cement track. People with, died. <laughs> well, I think in other rides, other they rides. died doing that. I don't know if they died but, in that. But ride. we would all get really badly injured and go to the nurse. And when we got to the nurse, she would put a disinfectant on where the skin had been ripped off. And every person in New Jersey would have the same reaction. They would spray the disinfectant, and then the person would be like, "You motherfucker!" <laughs> You know, at the nurse, the poor sweet lady, and every person would walk up like they weren't going to do it, and then they would do it. And so that was what was in my head, right? that he would explode at her in a way you wouldn't see coming. And so I said to Seth and Evan, just make a list of interesting curses. And then I said, make one column of clean ones so we have alternatives in case we need to show this on ABC one day, we can re-edit a clean version. And so then Seth walked up to me, and there's a video of this uh, on YouTube. There's the making of the waxing scene. Right. And one of the things just said, Kelly Clarkson. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a very open space. We want to get a good version of the scene. We want to throw lines at people. We want them to improvise. You know, we're, we're really open to anything happening. And, you know, sometimes the best joke in the scene is the the random thing that's just on a list that, Seth and Evan hand you right. Do you ever get things that you just are like this? This like, this isn't working. It's just not working. I mean, it's oh, fine. Yeah. It's fine. I gotta let it go. I gotta move it on. We've worked on the scene. We've been improvising. It's not funny. There are definitely scenes where you think, oh, I guess that's not one for the history books. <laughs> <laughs> and then you hope when you get into post that you could fix it. And then every once in a while, you just have to put a joke in the back of someone's head in ADR, where you just record a new joke. Right. You show the other actor. And 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 we have saved a thousand with scenes. those post production jokes. Yeah. And I remember Wes and Owen talking about James Brooks forcing them to do that in Bottle Rocket. And if you watch Bottle Rocket, there's been incredible jokes incredible. on the back of people's heads. Yeah. But you know, a lot of that process I learned from Ben Stiller when we did the Ben Stiller show, because he would do this agent character and he would interview people like Roseanne and Tom or run DMC. And it was him giving terrible advice. And it was all kind of insulting. Right. And what he would always do is tell them we were done shooting this, the sketch. And then after they left, he would shoot his single again and just say much meaner things. <laughs> <laughs> the things he was afraid to say to their face. Oh my God. And then we would just riff all these crazy runs when they weren't there. Right. Uh, do you laugh a lot? Are you constantly laughing? Or are you so in your head because you want it to be great? You want it to be great that you don't, you're not feeling the funny as much as everyone else is? It, it depends. Certain things you, you are like, that's funny. Okay, that'll work. Let's move on. Uh, and then <laughs> other times you just start giggling. I just made a, this movie called The Bubble. The Bubble, which, when yeah. does that come out? That's going to come out uh, in the later in the spring. And crazy this movie is insane folks yeah i laugh so hard there's so many it's so ridiculous and it's like right at the beginning of the pandemic and all these actors are at this hotel yeah and they're just all going crazy yeah it's like actors trying to make a dinosaur action movie in london during the early part of the pandemic having <laughs> nervous breakdowns and fred armison plays the director so he's supposed I to be the, the, the sundance winner who gets his first big budget movie and he doesn't know how to handle it right. and it's during the pandemic and Fred would make me laugh out loud. So there's so some hard. people that just make you laugh. Yeah. Maria Bamford plays. Right. Uh, the, the, there's a TikTok star who's been jammed into the mm -hmm. movie played by my daughter, Iris. And we, we did Zooms with Maria Bamford as her mother. So she's Zooming conversations with her mother. And Maria just gets me every, every time she's like, is Timothy Oily Fant in the movie? I love Timothy Oily Fant. <laughs> Timothy Oliphant. Uh, Seth Rogen, uh, is it true that you credit him with influencing you to make your work more outrageously dirty? Well, certainly Seth felt like comedy wasn't edgy enough for his taste. Right. So when we first started working together, uh, you know, in movies after Undeclared, where we couldn't be that edgy. We were, you know, desperately trying to get someone to pay attention to Superbad and not having a lot of success. One of the stories that always makes uh, Seth and I laugh is that 
there was this producer that we added to our team because we thought maybe it's us. Maybe if we had a more powerful producer, he could get us the money. So we ha we have this producer join our team. And then suddenly he gets hired to be the head of Paramount. And we think, well, now we'll make the movie. He's the head of Paramount. And the first thing he did as head of Paramount was to say no to the Jesus movie that he was the producer Christ. of. Um, but during the, the writing of The 40-Year-Old Virgin, you know, Seth was one of the producers on it. And he really thought it was funny to make Steve uncomfortable. So in his work uh, as the guy in the stock room with Steve, he went hard and dirty and uncomfortable and it made us laugh so hard <laughs> to do that to Steve. And Steve, I think as a comedy person also isn't like a dirty comedian. Right, he's, you know, don't he, think of him like that. He, you know, he's a smart, subtle, witty, brilliant guy and he'll go there. But it really made Steve uncomfortable and it, oh, to the point where Steve wasn't sure where the line should be in the movie. And I think Seth was a big, you know, a big influence on right. a lot of, you know, that kind of, you know, talking about a donkey show in Mexico type, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> type, type joke runs. Right. You know, and that extended through, you know, other things like, you know, Superbad and Pineapple Express. I mean, he, he really wanted to put the pedal to the metal on some of the joke style. You take a lot of risks with with newcomers. I say newcomers like Pete Davidson and uh, Amy Schumer, who had a, a ton of they didn't have a ton of acting experience. And so when you take on a role like that, like this is the lead role, we're doing King of Staten Island. How much work is that extra on you to get performances out of someone to, I mean, that's that seems like it's a, a difficult task you're setting yourself up for someone who hasn't really acted or maybe they just naturally fall into place. Yeah. It's not really about the performances as much as the writing. The writing just takes a lot of work. It just takes. Why is that? What do you what do you mean? Because you know when the movies work, they're usually very personal. Even if they're big comedies, the core idea of it is a personal idea to Amy or to Pete about relationships or about getting over trauma and grief. And so you're asking someone to really go there. These aren't like Ghostbusters type premises. Yeah, they're very personal, and so you have to develop with them over sometimes an extended period of time. With Amy, it was, it was kind of short because she wrote. If you gave her notes, she would hand you a new draft like five days later. She really worked hard. And and when we get to the set, usually we've done auditions and we've done table reads. And by the time we get there, we know what we're doing. The, the hard work is in the conception of it. I think Bill Burr is just genius in that movie too. Train or uh, in uh, King so of Island. So He's good. such a good actor. He's such a, I love that guy. Yeah, he was in an episode of Crashing with Pete Holmes and we were all blown away by his acting. I know. And I just thought, oh my God, there's so much more here with Bill. And he's not in a lot of movies where he's you know featured and given the space to create from his place. Right. And very early on, Pete was like, you got to get Bill Burr. You got to get Bill Burr. And we were so lucky. And then he, he was even 10 times better than we thought he might be. But again, the, like the core of that is very personal. Bill and Pete know each other. There's an intimacy there. Bill cares about Pete. And even though in the movie he's annoyed by Pete, you kind of feel underneath that there's some love there. Right. And so they have that chemistry that comes from life that we're able to tap into in the movie this is these are from my patrons i have a patreon account these yes. are rapid fire got you this you just answer them as quickly as you you would like to or i'll babble for 11 minutes on each you one. could do whatever the hell you want i know you're a busy <laughs> guy so i don't want to keep you too much i just love this i seldom am really just like excited yes. about something i could talk to you for hours and i'm not going to do that to you because i know you're busy so here we go shit talking with judd apatow nika what does your style of feedback to an actor sound like Usually I'm walking up and I'm nervous. So I have to hide the fact that I'm nervous about doing my job well. So it's usually enthusiasm coming through my stress about if I'm going to screw up the scene. So it might be like, uh, yeah, I think that's that's working. Maybe there's a thing that we could do where you... <laughs> That's probably, that's probably the vibe. That's you. Yeah, I'm not like, ee, I'm just kind of like, I probably sound stressed. <laughs> so people are a little insecure, like, is Judd happy? Well, no, more happy? like I'm praising, but also letting you know we're going to do 
a whole bunch of other things. But the key thing I do as a director is I let people know we're going to take our time. I think most people's acting diminishes because they don't know how many takes they're going to get. Right. And so you're like, God, I better nail it. Maybe I'm going to get two shots at this. I always tell the actors, we're going to be here until we like it. And tell me if you like it. Do you like what you did? Because uh, I'm really? feeling good now. And I feel like just saying that to people, they get way better. And all that stress that screws up their performance disappears if they know that you're going to give them time and that you're going to pay attention to if they're happy with it. Do you get actors that are just like, I don't want any more takes. Do we got it? Oh, come on. What else do you want? I'm just ready to move on. I'm tired. I don't want to. Uh, not too often, but I remember with Fred Armisen, I, he would just make me laugh. So I would make him riff for like 10 straight <laughs> minutes sometimes. And he never would give you a look like, okay, Judd, we got it. Never. Really? The first second looks exactly the same as 10 minutes in. Like if I didn't say cut and, and you had a digital card, a digital memory card that lasted an hour, he would never stop. And it would all be at the same level. Were you ever nervous about giving an actor a uh, direction that was just kind of like, oh, he's going to snap at me? Or some guy who just like, isn't that fun to work with? You don't have to say any names. Well, Rip Torn was <laughs> terrifying because anything you said to him, he was gonna, going to knee jerk know you. Right. So if you said, uh, uh, Rip, I think that uh, you might be a little more irritated here. I'm not irritated. <laughs> I know what's going on here. I don't need to be irritated. You know? And then what he would do is, you know, blow up at you. And then if you did like three more takes on the third one, he would suddenly take your note without talking about it. And so that I realized was, was the trick. He never wanted to say you were right, but then he would try it. Leanne, what surprised you the most about being a parent? Or what surprises you? About being a parent? I, you know, everything surprised me because... As you know from Knocked Up, we didn't know we were going to become parents. And so every what surprised me was that every single thing I knew about being a parent was from what I had seen in TV shows and in movies. And everything that was difficult about being a parent wasn't in TVs and TV and movies. Like none of it applied. <laughs> That's That was the thing that surprised me. Right. Did, does Iris and Maude, do you, are you happy they're in, going into acting? They're into acting. They're obviously doing a lot of stuff. Maude's on euphoria mm -hmm. right are you excited about this you like that she's kind of following your footsteps she's doing this i mean obviously you're not an actor but are you happy about that it's hard for me to judge it because as a kid i so wanted to do this type of work so there's no part of me that thinks this is a mistake for them to have the same fun <laughs> i'm having right but yet it's very stressful and you want them to be in it for the right reasons and you want them to be passionate about you know, their artistic life. You don't want them in it for the ego. Right. You want and that's them. tough. That's tough. Yeah. And so we've talked about that from birth, you know, like, why are you doing it? You know, because if it's just to get liked by people, it won't work. Yeah. It has to be because you care about what you're doing. And I think, you know, they're both making choices that are about quality and following their passion. So euphoria has been pretty incredible this year. And it's been fun to see Maude on the show. And Iris is really funny in the bubble yeah and yeah we had a good time shooting that so did they like your direction did they go dad i don't know when iris was on love the tv show we did Loved for netflix love. thank you I, I when i would show up on the set when i wasn't directing like john slattery directed a bunch of the episodes iris would always say why are you here i'm like well, i'm the producer of the show i, I don't need you here like, she so enjoyed not being directed by me. <laughs> Maya P., which of your films would you love to make a sequel to? Out of all the, out of all the movies. I'm pretty close to deciding if I'm going to make This Is 50 in the next year. I have an idea for it. I'm trying to decide if people really want it. Uh, uh, but... I do get I want it. I'm, I'll be 50 in four months. Yeah, I get a lot of feedback on This Is 40. I feel like the, the world of TikTok and Instagram... Uh, has elevated it. There's so many little moments that circulate. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of people saying, are you going to do this is 50? It's time. Like they've tracked it, that it's been 10 years. So probably, probably that one. And I always wanted them to do a sequel to super bad. And I know that Jonah said, Oh, it'd be funny to do it when we're 70 or 80, <laughs> but I <laughs> really wanted long. them to do a super bad in college where Jonah flunks out of college and just shows up and, visits michael sarah at college but everyone everyone was like nah we don't want to screw up super bad by accidentally making a crappy second one and i would always say the same thing 
Well, that's like saying don't make the second episode of the of the Sopranos. Right. <laughs> like, so why do you think we would screw up the second one? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Danny, I, I'd like to go back to the start of Judd's career and ask the favorite joke you wrote for Larry Sanders. The show was groundbreaking. Like a, a favorite joke I wrote for Larry Sanders. Couldn't be a joke or a moment or a scene or. You know, one thing I'm very proud of that I worked on at Larry Sanders was the Jim Carrey moment in the finale. So Jim Carrey said he would do the show after not really answering for six years. So for six years, I asked him to do the show. And he would always not say no, but not say yes. And then finally, I called him. I said, Jim, it's literally the last episode. This is your only shot to be on The Larry Sanders Show. And he said, I'll do it if I could be the best person who's ever done it. It has to be the best scene in the history of this show. That's what he said to you. <laughs> That's what he said to me. I said, okay, Jim, let's do it. And so we were <laughs> trying to figure out what it would be. And, and there was a very funny idea about that Jim would come on. And then in the commercial break, he would be really mean to Larry and say, oh, you're leaving you leave in TV, you, you think you're gonna do movies? I'll destroy you. <laughs> and so we had that idea, but we didn't know what else to do. And years before, when both of us were single, one night we were talking to these, these women at the improv and they live like across the street and we wind up across the street and like nothing like happened, but they made us pancakes in the middle of the night. And then a woman put on Jennifer Holiday in, uh, uh, what's that movie? Not um, Dream Girls. Dream Girls. Doing, right. and I'm telling you, yeah, you know, yeah, that big song, and she just lip synced it for us, and it was like a blue velvet kind of bizarre <laughs> moment with me and Jim <laughs> in the strangers' apartment watching this woman <laughs> lip sync very emotionally to this <laughs> song, and I never forgot it. And I said to Jim, maybe you could sing that song <laughs> on the last Larry Sanders, and. It, he did it. It was so incredible. And after the first take, Gary was like, yeah, that's it. We're done. And Jim's like, no, no I want to do it again. I could do it better. And Gary was like, you want to do it again? <laughs> like he couldn't believe that there was any energy in Jim's body to like try to do it. And it was better. better? And, it, and it was better. It was better. And here's the crazy thing. I'm, I'm editing the documentary about Gary Shandling. And I get the footage, the raw dailies because I'm going to like recut the sequence in the doc. What's in the doc is not how it aired. And I noticed my mom is in the audience. And and also the guy who owns Largo, my good friend Mark Flanagan is in the audience with John Bryan. Wow. Who scored Eternal Sunshine and The Spotless Mind and a lot of my movies. Yeah. And that that really blew me away. So in the doc I I use the moment where you see my mom that's beautiful. Yeah. Did you get emotional? Oh, yeah. I just couldn't believe it. It was weird. Do you get emotional a lot? Oh, yeah. I'm an easy... Easy cry. Easy what makes you cry? Uh, everything. Everything. I could cry. I, literally, the amount of times I'm crying, it's, it's... Like when you see your daughter have a good performance or something, you oh, cry? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Literally everything. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, mean I, I like being emotionally yeah. accessible and, and vulnerable. So, yeah, TV, movies, you know, mo you know, most things. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go really hard. I think about when I was a kid, my grandfather died of a heart attack when I was a, a senior in high school. And I'm at his funeral and he had produced a record by Red Buttons, the Borscht Belt comedian. And I'm sitting in a chair, bawling my eyes out, just snot and spit, just crying. And then suddenly, like someone said, Judd, this is red buttons. And I like shook his hand. Your emotional mid, mess. mid snotty, <laughs> bawling cry. <laughs> oh man, that's amazing. By the way, you, you still go to therapy? You do therapy? Oh, yeah. You go to you, you get anxiety, you deal with yeah. all that shit? Yeah. A lot of times I have two therapists. Really? I've, 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 I, I, all the last few years I've had two therapists with two different ideas. One's a little more of a more Buddhist mindfulness. Going the idea. Gary Shandling path, maybe? And the other one's a little more about like evolution and fight or flight response and just almost the brain chemistry that leads to your panic or anxiety or depression. And, and I, I found that all really interesting. Just the way evolution has built you to be depressed. 
It built you to be scared. It thinks it's saving your life. And my therapist said to me, there's nothing your brain would like to do more than get you to stay in bed all day because then you're safe. Yeah. Then a bear won't eat you. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and just the reality of what you're working against that your body holds on to the bad stuff and kind of doesn't hold on to the good stuff because remembering the bad stuff in evolution saved your life. Oh, don't go in that cave. That's the one with the bear. And so you'd remember it the rest of your life. But if you had a nice meal and ate some berries in the woods, you would just forget it five <laughs> minutes later. And yeah. that's really what life is, that you tend to hold on to the dark stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah. And lately, lately I haven't, I haven't gone in a little while because I, I, there's a couple of self-help books I like so much. I'm trying to see if I could really tune into them. There's one called The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. Uh, that is, it's all about the things we do to try to make everything in life work and how it makes no sense that you right. want every interaction to be positive and everything to work out well and how we're just making ourselves crazy mentally by that process. We're trying too hard maybe. You know how I look at it? I, I think of it this way. I think I'm in comedy, but my big issue is that I need to lighten up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a perfect uh, ending point. Look, you got the George Carlin documentary. What's it, what's it called? We have a title yet? It's called George Carlin's American Dream. George Carlin's, you must have just come up with that recently. Well, that was, uh, yeah, and that's the name of the big routine that some of the documentary is built around. And then uh, Sicker in the Head, you could you could order online now, the book of uh, and the interviews. Bubble. And the bubble will be out this spring on Netflix. There'll be a trailer coming out in a couple of weeks, and you'll see something super weird. Super weird. Super weird. We went... Somebody called me up and they I let them see it and they went, it's bonkers. I, like, you just <laughs> it is. It's it's more bonkers than anything you've ever done, I think. Yeah, it's a, it's as close as we get to it's not exactly this, but it is a kind of a combo between Tropic Thunder, a Christopher Guest movie, and <laughs> and a Mel Brooks movie. Sure. I, I could see that. It's That's meant good... to just be a way of saying to the audience. The last few years have been so terrible. Can we at least laugh at it? Yeah. Can we just take a moment to commiserate look, about what we've been through? Look at the shit we've been through. Yeah. This is kind of like a, a little piece uh, of candy about this it. This has been an absolute joy. Uh, I can't thank you enough for being here. Ryan's a big fan of yours, as are everyone. I think everyone out there is probably a fan of Judd Apatow's. I appreciate that. I think it's safe that. to say that. Uh, I hope you have more and more success and bring us more and more good feeling movies and i hope uh 50 year old virgin not 50 year old virgin that could be it it could maybe i do a combo could. crossover crossover <laughs> that would be amazing uh thank you for allowing me to be inside of you today i've always wanted it the, this is really i mean i reached out for it you, you did and not only that but you know it's seldom i guided you into me i i just sent a message <laughs> to him this never happens by the way i just said i'd love to have you on my podcast and usually it's like oh whatever whatever he immediately responds and goes, "Let's do it." I'm a listener. I like it. I was on the I was on a plane. I was listening to the Kevin Nealon interview, and <laughs> you were talking about Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, and I literally looked up, and someone was watching it in front of me, and you were on the screen. What are the and odds I took a of picture that? of it and sent it, and to, sent it you. to me. What are the odds of that? It was Such really a random weird. movie. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and Kevin Nealon was amazing. But I love Kevin Nealon. He was like, "Rose, mom, is this therapy for you?" This is. <laughs> he's just leaning. Oh my god, he's so funny. I love him. Uh, thank you. This is amazing. Thank you. All right. Oh, what would would you like mostly about that one? Just the, the, that it happened. <laughs> you were. You know. I. You know. What's funny is that you never, ever have asked this. But you, well, while I'm walking out with Judd, before, he didn't see it, but I, he goes, "Hey." You go, hey, can you get a picture? Him? Well, no, what happened? What happened? What, I think you sensed. I, I, sensed did, I, did, I didn't ask. I sensed it in your face. You're like, Ugh. You just went ahead and said, here's here's how you did it. And it was really kind of nice. It was very subconscious. Uh, you, you went, hey, let's all get a picture. And then you're like, oh, I can't get myself in the frame. Here, I'll just do one of you two. And then you did one. Bam. I you, remember that now. You do. Well, we I did didn't it. ask. We did it. I'm not good about asking for things, and you did it for me. And that was well, very nice. I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. you appreciating it. Yeah, and uh, I think he appreciated it. He's uh, he's a gem, man. He's a legend. Yeah. He's uh, Judd. If you're listening, thank you. Thank you for coming on the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just a reminder, guys, if you like the podcast, please write a review. 
please write a review and follow us at Inside You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, at Inside You Pod on the Twitter. I'm going to be in St. Louis this coming weekend to sign autographs and to do a Smallville Nights improv show with Tom Welling. Get your tickets. I'll be in Liverpool the weekend of May 21st. Uh, June 10th, I'll be in Metropolis, Illinois. Uh, Australia, June 17th through the 28th. And uh, also uh, my band, Sunspin. We're coming out with a new album. We're going to be playing uh, May 28th, which is a Saturday. Am I correct? Is that a Saturday? How would you know that? Uh, the, it is a Saturday. You're sure? I am. Because I'm on a plane on the 29th, it is. Which, which is a Sunday. It's a yeah. Saturday, yeah. folks. Um, so thank you for all the support and love. But come come watch uh, the band. You can go to stageit.com and get tickets. Or you can go to sunspin.com. You can also book Zooms. You can go on Cameo with me. I'm on there. And uh, what would I do without my patrons? My lovable patrons who support the podcast. I talk about you every week because it's just the truth. And you stick around and it's it's marvelous sometimes i feel like do i want to still do this podcast and then you know so much feedback so much love that how could i not want to do it so uh thank you for keeping me motivated excited and feeling blessed uh go to patreon.com slash inside of you if you want to join patreon and help the podcast out uh right now also big thanks to ryan right here my man bryce my man jason couldn't do the podcast without you Literally couldn't do it. I, I just, I'd be fucked. Mm-hmm. I'd be completely fucked. Did I say <laughs> F twice in a row? You I did. try not to say it. It's, you know, it's okay. Every once in a while, it's all right. You're an adult. I'm an adult. Here we go. These are the top tier patrons. If you join Patreon, if you're in the top tier, you get your name read off every week on every episode. These are the people that really help out. Nancy D, Leah S, Sean, uh, Sarah V, Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jill E, Brian H, Nico P, Robert B, Jason W, Kristen K, Raj C, Joshua D, CJP, Jennifer N, Stacy L, Jamal F, Janelle B, Kimberly E, Mike E, Eldon, uh, Supremo, 99, More, R- Mira, Ramira, Santiago yeah. M, Chad W, Liam P, Janine R, Maya P, Maddie S, Belinda N, Chris H, Dave H, Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H, Tabitha, T. Wow. Tom N, Liliana A, Talia M, Betsy D, uh, Chad L, Rochelle, Marion, Meg K, Dan K, Dan N, as mm. in nice. Angel M, Rhiannon C, Corey K, Super Sam, Dev Nexon, Michelle A, Jeremy C, Andy T, Cody R, Gavinator, David C, John B, Brandy D, uh, Vor, Camille, uh, N, H, S, S, The, C, Joey M, Willie F, David H, Omar I, Design OTG, Eugene and Leah, Chris P, Nikki G, Corey, Nicole, Patricia, Heather L, Jake B, James B, Bob at Joshua B, Tony G, and don't forget Mel S. Can't forget Mel S. Uh, Orlando C, John B, Caroline R, Rob E, Rob, Robbie, I said, Paul C, Christine S, Sarah S, Eric H, Spring, Jennifer R, Shane R, and Emma R. Those are the top tier patrons. Couldn't do it without you. I thank you guys all for listening. I really appreciate you. We're going to keep doing this. Try to give you interviews that make you think, that help you out maybe, that uh, some people you can relate to. Um, We try to get deep every episode. But uh, from myself, Michael Rosenbaum, here in the Hollywood Hills of California. Ryan Tay is here as well. An old wave to old camera C. That's camera C up (laughs) there. We're going to call that camera C now. We're going to call that camera C after all these years. Great. Uh, We love you. Be good to yourself. Most importantly, thank you for allowing me to be inside of each and every one of you. It means the world. And I'm wearing the hat today. I haven't worn the hat in a while. I don't feel like I wear the hat as as frequently. It's a good hat. It's a good hat on me. And I can't find one that's just like this. It's got to be a big enough hat to fit my head. I've got a big head, Ryan. you got a Sasquatch head. i got a Sasquatch hat and head. Is that what you said? A head? Hat. Head. Head. Whatever. Whatever. Uh, I love you guys. Thanks so much.